Good morning and welcome to worship here at Bethlehem United Methodist Church. Thank you for connecting with us online. We're so glad that you are here. I have a few announcements today that I'd like to lift before we begin our time of worship. First of all, this coming Saturday, May the 1st, will be a shredding event out in the parking lot sponsored by our green team. You're invited to bring documents that you need to have shredded. I think we'll be out here from 9 until 12. Uh, donations are welcome. Also, May the 15th, we have the Boomer Band concert that's going to also be in the parking lot. Tickets are $10 per person. You can purchase those through a link on our website. Also, through the Buzz, you can get to that location to purchase tickets. Tickets are limited, and they will be required to be here for the concert, so I encourage you to get those tickets early. Lastly, I also want to acknowledge that uh, David and I are not wearing masks today. We actually, in this pre-recording session, there are three of us here in the sanctuary, uh, and all of us have been vaccinated. So per following uh, rules that are set out by the CDC, we're taking off our masks today and sharing, uh, hopefully, a better sound quality with you as we lead in worship and worship together. Thanks again for joining us. I invite you to grab your order of worship and settle in. Let us center ourselves. And let us begin our time of worship with the choral call to worship. Let all things now living, let us sing together. Please join me in our opening prayer. Everlasting God, who out of the greatness of your love sent your Son to care for us as the great Good Shepherd, who lived and died and was raised from the dead, our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, grant that we may humble ourselves before you today, that we might express our love through our words and deeds of concern and care for all those we find in need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is For the Beauty of the Earth, as we celebrate again uh, April as Earth Month, and this past Thursday, April 22nd, is Earth Day. Let us sing.
morning, boys and girls. It's a joy to be with you in worship this morning at Bethlehem. Today, I am coming to you from room 129 in our children's wing at church. This is also our enrichment classroom for our Thursday and Friday groups of the preschool. And today, I'm here on Friday, and it's our two- and three-year-old class enrichment with Ms. B and Ms. H. And today, they are working on bird feeders. And this goes along with what we have been celebrating all month here in the preschool. And I'm sure you have talked about some at school or at home with your family. And it is Earth Month. We have been celebrating Earth Day and Earth Month all of April, especially here in the preschool, and I'm sure at your school as well. And during this month, our green team members have come to our preschool classes and we have read together and talked about ways that we can celebrate Earth Month at home. And our green team members read a story about Noah and the ark and we talked about ways that we can build arks at our home. Now we're not talking about building a big boat in your yard like God told Noah to do, but we can build different kinds of arks. When I'm talking about an ark, I mean ways that we can care for the animals around us that God created. The same way Noah cared for animals by listening to God and getting two of every animal on that giant boat to keep them safe from the rain. So there are ways that we can build arks for animals around us and listen to God calling us to care for his creation. And one of those things our preschoolers are doing today. They are taking pine cones, which you can find in your yard, or you may even be able to buy them at the store or find them in a neighbor's yard. They're taking pine cones and they are using peanut butter. They're gonna take their knives and dip it in the peanut butter and rub it all over this pine cone. And then they have these little cups with bird seed in them. They're gonna pour it out on this paper and roll this peanut butter covered pine cone in the bird seed. And they're gonna sit them outside. Do you know what they're gonna become? They're gonna be bird feeders. And these are ways that we can care for birds by offering them food. And these are special bird feeders because everything we use in them is natural. So the pine cones are part of nature. They're gonna rot and go away so we don't have to worry about the plastic being left behind or hurting the birds because the birds know all about pine cones and they love nuts and they love bird seed. So the peanut butter will hold this bird seed on there so that they get a special treat that cares for them and also doesn't hurt them with plastic or man-made materials. So this is something you can do at your home. We've also talked about bird nests and how bird houses, we can put up bird houses and roosting boxes are ways that we can care for God's creation. And another way is planting flowers. So we have sunflowers, and these are perennial wildflowers that the children are planting that you can plant at your home that attract pollinators like birds and bees. And these sunflowers especially care for our animals, care for our birds because they are beautiful and they offer shade, but they also offer a yummy meal when they dry out because this middle area becomes sunflower seeds that our birds can eat and you and I can eat sunflower seeds as well. So these are wonderful ways that we can build arcs that care for animals around us and celebrate Earth Month all year long. So I hope you and your family can find a way to celebrate Earth Day and celebrate Earth Month by caring for the world around you, by giving animals something special to eat that won't hurt them, and also keeping your eyes open for things that maybe we have left behind that could hurt creation. So being sure to pick up trash when we see it, to not litter and to recycle are also ways that we can care for God's creation and care for one another. Thank you boys and girls for joining me this morning. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Earth Month this April, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your stories of creation and of Noah's Ark and the way that you have called your people to care for your creation. 
as you are calling us now to do the same. Help us, Lord, to see the beauty that you have created every day and to care for that, whether that's caring for our plants and animals and each other. We are all part of your creation that you call us to love and care for. Watch over these boys and girls, and may they have a wonderful and blessed week. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye-bye, boys and girls. I hope you have a good week. Thank you, Megan. And um, I would like to say I appreciate the preschoolers and all that they've been doing this past month, and particularly this week, to remind us of the little things that we can do to uh, care for God's good earth. I too want to say welcome to Bethlehem. It's a joy to be able to take my mask off and to, to preach without a mask. Uh, during in-person worship on Sunday, we will, we will wear the mask and continue that until we get further uh, guidelines on that or instruction. But um, we're grateful that you have joined us for worship today. Uh, this is a beautiful time of the year. Um, Today, Saturday, that we're recording, it's going to get rain this afternoon, but Sunday is sunshine and clear skies. And then this week, it's going to be in the 80s, so certainly much to be thankful for. I'd like to move us towards our prayer time, and there are some special prayer requests. Um, as you know, the, the nation of India is really struggling with the pandemic and other places in the world. Um, so we want to lift up India uh, in the number of cases that they have that is a tremendous number and pray for them and also in our country where more people are being vaccinated it does allow us to have more people in worship and we look forward to a day that um, we can have lift the restrictions and be back together I do invite uh, some of you to be um, more in present in worship and we can have more people here so we look forward to having uh, people in worship that have not been before but continue to pray for our response to the pandemic and keeping one another safe and doing what we need to do uh, to care for one another and but also praying um, to pray for our nation the Derek Chauvin trial is over but the work for racial justice continues there is much violence in our land so we want to pray for an end to violence and mass shootings and um, efforts of our police department and and um, just pray for safety and for help for us as a nation that we can make the changes that we need to make there are some folks that I'd like to lift up particularly that have been sick those in the hospitals let's continue to lift up Stuart Woodford who remains in Lynchburg General our friend Paul Evelyn who had a brain surgery to relieve uh, bleeding there so we're glad that that has happened and others there are some folks that are very seriously um, ill with cancer, and Bill Miller is one, uh, Gail Marshall, um, Norma Jarrett's son, Rick. So let's pray for those who are um, going through cancer right now and those in hospice care. And um, I know there are those on your hearts and minds that we would like to lift up in prayer today. So let me invite you to join me in our call to prayer. It is His name is wonderful, so let us be called to prayer as we sing.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, what a privilege it is today to worship you, to say how wonderful you are, to praise your holy name, to thank you for all of creation and the beauty all around us. We thank you for your world. We thank you for all that we have in life. And we ask God your blessings upon us as we now give this service to you and worship you, for you are our God. We pray, Lord, for our world, and particularly through this pandemic and nations that are struggling. Pray for the nation of India and for its leadership, that they can respond and help their citizens. Thank you, God, for the help that you have given us in this country with the vaccines and so many people who are, have been able to receive them. We look forward to days ahead where we can do things that we have done in the past, and we're grateful, God, for um, the medical care that we get and for medical science. Lord, we lift up those who are in need today. We pray for those who are sick, those whom we have named. Others, God, who are in rehab or those in health care facilities and hospitals, you know, Lord, our needs. We need healing in our world and in our nation, Lord, that for the divides that are there, the political divides, the racial divide, gender divide, all the things that keep us apart from one another. We ask, God, that you would bring us together in love. Lord, we pray for those that we might be with right now or those who are on our hearts and minds, we ask, God, that your will be done in their lives and in our lives also as we give our lives to you anew. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our good shepherd and we belong to you. We pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us when we prayed to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen i want to say again thank you for your faithfulness in giving and being faithful to uh, your tithes and offerings, and I'd like to offer a prayer for that now. Gracious God, once again, we say thank you for the blessings in life that you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you, that you bless these gifts that we return to you, these gifts that belong to you. We recognize that all things come from you, and we joyfully return to this that is yours. So multiply that and use it for the glory of your kingdom and the work of your church on earth. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning uh, is from the Old Testament. We'll be reading from the Psalms, and one that's very familiar to all of us, many of us, I should say, Psalm 23. And before I want to read, I, I do want to lift up and mention that we read our scripture from the Common English Bible. And as you hear this scripture, you might say, well, that's not the one that's in my heart that I learned when I was a child. But everything we do here at Bethlehem, we seek to be outward bound. Those are the first two words in our vision statement. And so we want what we bring to be something that will connect with people who may not have grown up with church, who may be new to the church. So I invite you to hear the 23rd Psalm in the Common English Bible Version translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. 
My cup is so full, it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our New Testament reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 16. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. When the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. That's because he isn't the shepherd. The sheep aren't really his. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. He's only a hired hand and the sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. 
just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I give up my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheep pen. I must lead them too. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you that you love us, that we are yours, that Jesus is our good shepherd, and we belong to him. So I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in high school, I had a friend by the name of Lee Ramsey. Lee was the son of the pastor of our church, First United Methodist Church in Tifton, Georgia. Lee was a year uh, ahead of me in school, and when he graduated from high school, he went to Young Harris College, a a two-year school at the time, it's a four-year school now, in the mountains of North Georgia. Uh, The next year, I followed him there, and then the next year, Cheryl followed me. When he graduated from Young Harris, he transferred to Emory University in Atlanta and then Candler School of Theology and was ordained and began to serve churches in the North Georgia Conference. And of course, my path brought me to Virginia to serve uh, as a United Methodist clergy. Um, About 10 years after that, I caught up with Lee at a retreat at Lake Genaluska in North Carolina. And you know how it is when you see someone that from your childhood or that you went to school with, you want to catch up, you want to tell stories and share what's going on. And he told me that he was serving as the pastor of a Spanish-speaking congregation in downtown Atlanta. And I just thought that was fascinating. I said, well, do you preach in Spanish? He said, yes, I preach in Spanish. What kind of challenges does that bring? And he shared with me some. And one of them was that It was a challenge for him to get the congregation to refer to him not as padre, father, but as pastor. And I thought that was great, and it helped me to really appreciate the word pastor because, to be honest, it was not one that I really embraced. And really, it was just up until this, since I've been here at Bethlehem, that I prefer the term pastor In the past, someone would ask me, well, what shall we call you? Should we call you Reverend Lord or Pastor Lord? And I'd say, well, I'd prefer you just call me David, but if you're going to be formal, uh, Reverend Lord. But not so now, because particularly our scripture today, uh, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and pastor in Latin means shepherd. And so Jesus is the good shepherd. He is our pastor. We belong to him. We are members of his church, his flock. We are the sheep of his pasture. Contrast that with the hireling, the hired hand. He says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. But the hired hand, when he sees the wolf coming, when there is danger, when there is a threat, runs away because the He does not own the sheep. He is simply a hired hand. The sheep do not belong to him. He says they're not really his. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. He's only a hired hand, and the sheep do not matter to him. But Jesus is the good shepherd, and we matter to him. We belong to him. This past Wednesday was the last of our um, sessions of the Alpha Course for the winter um, period. We started early in January for the wonderful weekdays, and we started actually ahead of others, and we went the longest. We went 17 weeks, Um, and the reason was that typically in the middle of Alpha, we would have a weekend retreat where we would cover four of the sessions, and so we just tacked the four sessions uh, to the end, and which made it 17 weeks. The last session, I think, is the best because it talks about the church. 
what the church is and what the church isn't and what it means to be a part of the church. This past year, particularly since last March when uh, we could not meet in person in this church building that and other churches the same, that we all were reminded that the church is not the building. It's the people, not the building. And as we've said before, if somehow a tornado were to take this building away, we would still be the church. And I know it's been difficult for people who have uh, identified church with building and defined church as building, particularly uh, when they could not be in the building, they felt kind of lost. And some of them left churches like ours where there were restrictions to go to churches where there were not restrictions because they wanted to be in a building. Now, don't misunderstand, I, I am very thankful that we have the opportunity now to be in this building. It means something to us to worship together. And I will be wearing a mask on Sunday when there is a, a people in the pews until we get the word that, that, that it's okay to take off our mask, that we're vaccinated. But it's important for us to know that the church isn't simply the building, it's us that we belong to the Good Shepherd. We are part of His flock. We are the sheep of His pasture. And He lays down His life for the sheep. You know, I think about the parables Jesus told about a shepherd and sheep, and particularly the one where uh, a, a shepherd has a hundred sheep and leaves the 99 in the wilderness to go look for the one that was lost. And it makes you wonder, why would a shepherd do that? Why would he, he risk that? Why would he leave the 99 and go to find a lost sheep? You would think, well, maybe, you know, 1% isn't too bad to lose. And maybe it got lost and is gone forever, and uh, maybe some, an animal got it or a bandit took it. But no, the shepherd who loves the sheep, goes after particularly that which is lost and puts it on his shoulder and brings it home and celebrates and calls his neighbors in and says, let's have a party, let's celebrate because this one that was lost is now found. So Jesus goes after the lost sheep. Jesus cares for us. He's not the hireling. We belong to him. In that Alpha course, that last passage about the church, there were five words that we looked at to describe what it really means to be the church. And it was friends, family, home, Jesus, and love. And yes, friends. I think one thing that people have missed most, and I saw that actually on a list of, of uh, a survey, people who have not been able to come and be together in worship have missed their friends. And if you are a Christian, you have friends. You don't necessarily have to make friends. You have friends simply because you are a part of the church. And then family, we are truly connected as brothers and sisters in Christ. Some may want to leave the family, but like my cousin who 40 years ago became angry over an inheritance that he thought he should have gotten more of. It was over money, left the family, but he's still my cousin. Even though I haven't seen him or heard from him in 40 years, he's still family. We are family. We care about one another. And Jesus is our shepherd, the good shepherd, who lays down his life for his sheep. You know, I, I think about that, how Jesus loves us, how he cares for us, how he lays down his life for us. And I've often wondered, why is this passage always the scripture that is read on the fourth Sunday of Easter? Easter was three weeks ago. So the, counting Easter, this is the fourth Sunday of Easter. Because it's still fresh on our minds that Jesus laid down his life for us on Good Friday, which wasn't that long ago. And so we remember that. That's, we're thinking of that. But it's not just that Jesus died for us, that Jesus lays down his life for us. And in the days of, of Jesus in the first century, shepherds would do just that. 
You recall that, that um, David, the psalmist, the, the writer of the 23rd Psalm, who in his younger days was a shepherd, uh, killed a lion, killed a bear, uh, was good with his sling to protect the sheep because the sheep belonged to the family, belonged to his father and to him. You know that 23rd Psalm we love. I, I like the common English Bible because it, it, it said it in a different way. It gets our attention. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, or as common English Bible says, I lack nothing. He maketh me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. So all of that sounds wonderful. It just gives us a sense of belonging, of being cared for by the Lord who is our shepherd. But if you go on in that, it takes a turn right after that. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It, it reminds us that yes, there is danger. And there was an actual place that was the valley that was dangerous to shepherds. Bandits would steal sheep and there were, were wild animals. There were wolves that would attack the fold and the shepherd would have to defend. So yes, many people feel that they have been in valleys. They have they have been in that valley of the shadow of death, either literal death or maybe other troubles in their lives, and particularly this past year of all the loss and all the grief. Shadows of, of loss of jobs, shadows of broken relationships, shadows of illness, shadow of, of, of racial issues that divide our country, political divide, and the point is that we belong to Jesus who is our shepherd and he is with us in all of this. The shepherd leads us through and then prepares a table before me for us in the presence of our enemies. Our enemies surround us. Enemies of racism, enemies of violence, enemies of war, of discord and divide all the things that we've named, that, but yet he is with us. And the end of that is that surely in goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That we belong to God and God is with us in all of life and even into eternity. We belong to God. So Jesus lays down his life for us. But it isn't just his life, it's his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his presence with us through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And we'll celebrate that day toward the end of May on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and filled those early believers. So Jesus lived, teaching us how to live, calling us to be followers, to be like Jesus. Occasionally someone will say to me, why is it that you preach mostly from the Gospels and not so much from the Old Testament or the Epistles? It's because I want people to get to know Jesus. Even people who have been in the church for many years, I feel like just kind of know Jesus on a superficial level, kind of the Sunday school from a child level, when there's so much more there. So I want people to hear what Jesus says and to Pay attention to what Jesus does so that we can be more like him. We can be Christ-like. And to do that, we have to know who he is and what he says. So Jesus calls us to follow and to be a part of him, to follow his life. I have a friend who is a, a gun enthusiast. He's a young guy. He has uh, three children that are under the age of 10. His wife is a stay-at-home mom, and, and uh, she takes care of the household. And he has um, recently bought one of those uh, military-style rifles with uh, high-capacity magazines. And on weekends, he likes to go out with his friend and to, to shoot. And he also has a couple of handguns. And he said to me, he said, you know, if there were ever to be an intruder to come into my house, which is remote, uh, one that he imagines, that he also fantasizes about. He says, you know, I would be ready. 
I could take them out. I could stop them. I'm willing to lay down my life for my family. And I commend him for that. But while he might be willing to lay down his life to take someone out with his guns, he's not so willing to live for his family. He leaves that pretty much up to his wife. There's a lot of laundry at his house with three young children. He's never done a load of laundry. He's never loaded the dishwasher, changed a diaper, cooked a meal. Now, he will cook a steak on the grill or take out the garbage and mow the grass. But as far as caring for the children or taking them to things or being there for the family, he's not there. So while he says he would lay down his life for his family, he's not willing to live for them in the way that really he could. So Jesus is saying, I live my life. I die for you. I'm raised. I'm, ascend, I'm ascended. I'm present in my spirit for you. All of that. And he calls us to do the same, to not just die for Christ, which none of us will, I'm sure, be ever asked to die for our faith. Some Christians do in some countries, but not here. And so our call is to live for Christ. To live not just to lay down our life and die, but to give our lives in living for Christ. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. So we belong to Jesus. We are family. We are friends. We are home. We are Jesus. We are love. I give my life for the sheep. Verse 16 is an interesting one. I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheep pen. I must lead them too. They will listen to my voice and they, there will be one flock and one shepherd. You say, what's Jesus talking about? Another sheep pen? Those who belong to him that aren't us? I know biblical interpreters will say, well, he was referencing the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world where he came not just for the Jewish people, but for all people. That Jesus lived and died and was raised for the whole of the world and not just the Jewish people. But in their understanding, and in many anyway, they felt that they were the chosen ones. They were the only ones. Those who were non-Jews, the Gentiles, were not considered a part of God. They were outsiders. But Jesus is saying no. There are others that all people are part of my flock. I call all people, no matter what, excluding no one. I can't help but think about the church. You know, do we exclude people? Do we think that we're the only ones, our group? Or are there others that Jesus welcomes? I know our church, the United Methodist Church, has been struggling with this for almost 50 years now. In 1972, it was written into the Book of Discipline to exclude certain ones from our, our gathering, those who were other than heterosexual. It was written in and developed to where people were not welcomed if they were gay. People were not allowed to be married in the church or if they were called to ministry to serve in the church and you say well wait a minute we welcome all people but we've not because we have said we welcome you but not entirely not completely and ever since 1972 we have struggled and as you know in 2019 in the general conference where uh, the vote came that it was decided to retain the exclusive language of the discipline that, that does not allow for those who are gay to be married in church or to be in ministry or be ordained. People were disappointed in that. People were hurt. People left the church. 
Even in Bethlehem, there were those that said, you know, my son's gay, my daughter's gay, and if, if we are a part of a denomination that is not welcoming, then I don't want to be a part of that. And we lost several because of that. So we, we ask the question and we struggle with it. It's no simple thing because we want to call upon Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience to search the Scriptures, I mean, diligently, seriously, and not just proof texting to call upon tradition and reason. What does science say? And that's changed over the years. What's our experience here? And is it something we're going to be struggling with for a while, along with other denominations, all denominations? Who is welcome and who is not? Who is included and who is excluded? And not just that subject, but think about other ways that we have divided ourselves racially, politically, Republicans against Democrats, progressives against conservatives, black and brown against white, people who are wealthy and those who are poor, people who are educated and non, women and men. And the thing is, Jesus is saying, all are welcome, all are included. It's not just you, but there are others that will be included in my flock, and they will hear my voice. And they will follow so that there will be one flock, one shepherd. And that's Jesus the Christ. The final word of those five words of friends, family, home, Jesus. The final one was love. And really love is the key. Love is the answer because Jesus said that's what's most important. Loving God and loving others. And it will be love that will win and motivate us to include and to welcome and to bridge the divide and to be unified because the things that bring us together the things that unify us are far far greater than the things that divide us and so we need to recognize that we are a part of jesus that he is the good shepherd and we belong to him will you pray with me Thank you, Jesus, that you are our good shepherd, that you include all of us, that we are all welcome and invited. We're all a part of your flock as your sheep who, whom you love and for whom you died. So may we live our lives for you, loving and caring, welcoming and sharing the love with others. We pray this in your name. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, I, I want to mention that on the first Sunday of the month, we typically will celebrate Holy Communion. May is going to be a little different. We're going to celebrate Holy Communion on the third Sunday in May. I'm calling it our mid-May communion. So next Sunday, we will not celebrate communion. It will come the third Sunday in May, just to... Um, to give you a heads up on that one. Our closing hymn is He Leadeth Me. It's just the first stanza, and then I'll offer the benediction. So sing with me as, as we are led. He leadeth me. Again, thank you for worshiping with us today. I hope you have a wonderful week. We received the benediction. I'm going to offer a prayer. Thank you, 
Jesus, for leading us, for being our good shepherd. Fill us with your spirit so that we can share your love and your goodness and your grace to all we meet as those who belong to you. And now may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with us now and forevermore. Amen. Oh